Jeff, why would I ask questions that I already know the answer to? I don't know. Ask half of your colleagues out there that are trying to manipulate their prospects into a corner by asking them questions that they already know the answers to only to have their prospects say those things out loud. My name's Jeff Bajoric, and my career in sales has been a hell of a ride. And I want to bring you along with me. If you prefer to sell things at a premium, if you never want to win a deal on price, rethink the way you sell. Welcome back to the show. My name's Jeff Bajoric. I'm your host, and I'm here to help you rethink the way you sell. Today, we're going to talk about discovery, and I'm excited to discuss this with you because so many reps get this wrong. And I want to go into the ways that they get this wrong in just a second, but I want you to consider something right off the top. Most salespeople hurry through discovery so they can get to the selling part. I want you to consider that discovery is the selling part. And especially from a sell like you kind of point of view, um, this is where you get the most freedom. Uh, it's either this or prospecting, depending on how structured or firm you want to be in your prospecting methods, that this one of these two stages really gives you the most latitude. Closing, advancing, pr pretty stable pretty straightforward. There's not a whole lot of variety and, and things that you can bring to the table on a daily basis that are going to keep things fresh or spice things up. Uh, but when you're talking with a customer, either to get their attention or like what I'm going to talk about today with discovery, where you actually have their attention, uh, this is my favorite place to be um, as a seller. And uh, we're going to talk about that today. So here's where, let me start at the top here. Here's where most salespeople get it wrong. They try to hurry through it. They try to just go on a fact-finding mission. They do a really nice job of identifying the prospect's current state, but they fail to create any picture or paint any picture about what the prospect's future state is. Okay, so discovery is more than just understanding the problem that your prospect has, understanding where they are right now, and uh, you know, kind of getting a feel, filling out the blanks, right? Like you, you, this is not a customer intake form. You're not at the doctor's office. They're not doing a survey of a history and physical exam with you. You are actually trying to learn about what the customer wants to accomplish, not why they're stuck. And you also want to help them discover what they could be missing by not solving the problem they're talking to you about, rather than just staying where they are. This is not a cursory overview of their current situation. If you are not helping your customer discover what they're missing while you're helping yourself discover where they are, you're doing it wrong. OK, so the first thing that reps miss is that they try to go through it at a very high level, try to fill in their own blanks, try to use it as a checklist filling out kind of activity instead of actually exploring what the prospect is leaving on the table by not fixing their problem right now. The other thing that they do is they try to qualify. Let me go through BANT with you. Let me make sure you have the budget, the authority, the need, and the timeline that fits my needs. And if you don't, then I'm not going to talk to you. Oh, man, that, that is just missing the boat on so many ways. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need to know if the budget, the authority, the need, and the timeline are there. As a matter of fact, you do. That's where that acronym comes from. But what I'm going to tell you is you don't need to start there. As a matter of fact, the framework that I'm going to outline for you over the next couple of minutes is going to help you get the ANT part of that. They're going to volunteer that because it's part of, it's a normal part rather, of the discussion. And if the budget part, if their expected expenditures don't come out in that conversation, you will have earned the right to ask for it at the end. They know that you need to know that information. How are you going about earning it instead of just coming right out and asking it? And while I am a fan of being direct, I am a fan of asking for what you need. Come on, can we have can we show a little decorum here? Can we can we act like a professional? Can we not treat our prospects as if they're going through an interrogation and can we make this an interview and more like a conversation? Yeah, I think you can do that. And I think what can't be missed here is that the way you sell is as valuable as what you sell. 
The way you sell is is as valuable, if not more valuable, than what you sell. So if you carry yourself with a higher standard, or I should say, if you hold yourself to a higher standard and carry yourself a lot differently than some other reps, you're going to make that impression, and that impression is going to go a long way. So I've got a couple of frameworks, a couple of lists for you, if you will, uh, for how I approach discovery. I think if you can keep these concepts in mind while you're going through your discussions, you are going to win a lot more deals. You're certainly going to build a lot more confidence in your prospects that you are the one to help them get from where they are right now to where they want to go. And I'm going to save some of my deep dive uh, ideas and impressions for you because next week I'm going to be sitting down with Jason Bay to talk about discovery. And uh, I don't want to trample all over that discussion. I'm going to keep my big feelings to myself here beyond these couple of frameworks that I'm going to go through with you. And uh, I will let him bring the goods next week. Can't wait for you to uh, listen to that. I want you to think about a few things as you approach discovery. I want you to think about the six things that discovery creates, the, the six feelings, the six, um, well, they're, they're palpable. These are six things, six outcomes of great discovery. And I also want you to think about the three types of questions you should be asking during these meetings. So the six outcomes of great discovery are as such, they are here to follow. The first thing is you create a connection. You need to be connected to your prospect. And if you're just asking them if they have money and if they're willing to spend it and if they're ready to spend it right now, well, that doesn't exactly create a connection, right? There's no human connection there. You're basically qualifying to see if they're ready to work with you. And that's not exactly very welcoming. Okay, so what are you doing to invite your prospect to the conversation? Do they feel as if they're a part of it or do they feel like they're just spitting out answers? Consider that as you're pursuing the conversation. The second great outcome of great discovery is an understanding. Do you understand where they are now? Do you understand where they need to go? If you don't understand those things, if you don't understand what they're stuck on now and what the cost of inaction is, then you're not learning what you need to learn. Remember, this is not just a fact-finding mission. This is you hopefully creating tension between the, the, the position your prospect is in right now and where they ultimately want to be. Now, the next outcome of great discovery is what I just mentioned. It's tension. And I'll go all the way back to the beginning. You cannot create tension if you don't first create a connection. So you see how these kind of build on one another? But what you need to do, based on your understanding of their situation and where they want to go, you need to show them that you can help them get there. But before you, need to, before you can show them that you can help them get there, you need to demonstrate to them that where they're going is worth it, where they're going is uh, someplace that they want to be. Uh, where they are going is going to create or is going to require some sort of investment on their part, some sort of effort on their part. But you also need to show them that where they're going is going to be so much better than where they are right now that they really can't help but want to go there. And you do this by helping them understand what happens if they don't. Some people would call this finding pain. Some people would call this exacerbating that pain. I'm not a put people in pain kind of guy. If you've been listening to me for any length of time, you know that. But at the same time, we need to show them that there is a big space between where they are and where they want to go and that they'd be a whole hell of a lot better off for being there than from being where they are right now. The fourth outcome of great discovery is context. You get to understand a little bit about why they need to go where they want to go and what becomes possible if they get there. You know, it's one thing to say, look, I know you have a problem right now. I know your sales team needs some training. I know that you don't feel like your team is confident to go out there and create new opportunities and work those deals. And I know that if they had better skills as it related to prospecting and, and opportunity creation, then they would probably hit their number. But where most reps stop, they don't go the step further 
I say, okay, so what would your team do at that point? If I'm talking to a sales manager, a VP, and I say, look, I understand you need to upskill your reps. Okay, but what happens then when they're upskilled? Okay, well, we'll get better results. We'll, you know, have uh, more profitability. We won't have to discount as much. The end of the quarters will feel better. Yeah, I get it. Okay, and then what becomes possible? And then my prospect sits back and says, oh, wow. Well, and then what becomes possible is we can think about next year's goals a little bit earlier. We can set bigger goals. We can, we can feel like we're getting out of first gear and actually get this machine moving instead of constantly being stuck and feeling like we got to patch together a number every year. Wow. And then they almost always sit back and they say, <laughs> they get a little smile on their face, right? That's exactly what you want to help create. The context for why creating or why rather getting to that goal is so important. So the first outcome of great discovery is a connection. The second is an understanding. The third is tension. The fourth is context. The fifth is demonstrating your expertise. When you speak in all those terms, when you lay it out there right in front of them, like you know what they're going through and you've helped others go through this and get on the other side, get through to the other side before, you start to position yourself as the expert. And since so many of your competitors and colleagues don't do this, you start to position yourself as the only choice. You need to demonstrate some kind of expertise. I talked about this in the five forgotten fundamentals of prospecting. This was actually fundamental number four. You need to show yourself as the person who can help them get there, not just that they need to go there. Don't point them in the right direction. Lead them and demonstrate your capabilities. The last great outcome of great discovery is a level of comfort. When you discover, when you do discovery well, when you do great discovery, when you create the connection, I'm going to run down with the, I'm going to run them down again. When you create the connection, you create the understanding, the tension, the context, you demonstrate that expertise, you make them feel comfortable working and moving forward with you. That's what you need. You can't just put them in pain. You can't just get a needs analysis. You can't just remind them of where they are and say, are you ready to buy now? No, you have to remind them of where they are, show them where they could go, remind them of what happens if they don't go there, remind them what happens when they get there, and then show that you are the person not only that can take them where they need to go, but that they want to follow. That's what great discovery does. And that's why I say that Discovery is the selling part. And you can do this by asking questions. There is no presentation here. <laughs> there is no part of this discussion where you are pulling out a slide deck and saying, well, what we'll do then is this and this and this. No, you are asking questions. You're helping them say out loud what they've said before. You're helping them say out loud what they need to hear themselves say. You are helping them say out loud, often, something they have never said out loud before. And when you do this, when you create this space where they can go there, beautiful things happen. Now, here are the three types of questions I think you need to ask in order to create that environment. First and foremost, you need to ask them questions that they don't know the answers to. And this is where I get back to my anti-bant uh, you know, uh, uh, role here, my anti-bant routine, if you will. We'll get to the budget, the authority, the need, the timeline. What I want to do is I want to make them think. Jeffrey Gittermer called these power questions in the Little Red Book of Selling. These are questions that make them stop, consider new information, and answer, hopefully, in terms of you. So when I say they don't know the answers to these questions, what I mean is they need to think about them a little bit. You want to make your prospect think. If they're not thinking when you're talking to them, then you're not selling. So what are you asking them that is going to challenge their thought process? What are you doing? What are you asking in these conversations to make them think differently about where they are and where they want to go? The second kind of question you need to ask are answers that you, or I'm sorry, questions that you don't know the answers to. And 
It seems silly. Jeff, why would I ask questions that I already know the answer to? I don't know. Ask half of your colleagues out there that are trying to manipulate their prospects into a corner by asking them questions that they already know the answers to only to have their prospects say those things out loud. That's not fair. That's not nice. It's not professional. And that's not the way you should do it. So what I mean by these kinds of questions is ask them follow-up questions based on the answers they give you. Show them that you're paying attention. Show them that you're thinking right alongside them. Show them that you're paying attention. Show them that you are with them. This helps to demonstrate that expertise. This helps to create that level of comfort. This helps to underscore that connection. But if you're paying attention, if you're keeping your head where your feet are, you're going to be able to think on your toes or think on your feet, rather stay on your toes and, and really participate in this conversation. You're also going to show them that you're not robotic. You're also going to show them that you're not just running down a list of things that they need to fill out. This is really important. And the last kind of question I want you to ask are questions that neither of you knows the answers to. And these are those far off into the future daydreaming kind of questions. These are the ones where you are figuratively putting your arm around your prospect and looking off into the horizon, thinking about what could be. If you don't get to this stage, if you don't get to the place where you're asking these questions, you're not ready to present yet. If you're not co-creating some kind of better future for you and your prospect, then you're missing out. You can get there. Some conversations won't go there. Okay, that's great. That just means you need to have another discovery conversation. And a lot of your sales processes are going to require more than one. That's the other thing about discovery is there's no reason to hurry through this. You run out of your 30-minute time, uh, you know, time block, well, then schedule another one for two days from now, right? Look, Mr. Prospect, I'm really glad we had this conversation today. It feels like we have a lot of things that we can continue to go into great depth, learning about and discovering with one another. Um, I apologize that we're out of time, but I think you'd agree that this was a productive conversation and one worth continuing. What does your calendar look like for later this week? I promise it won't be another half an hour, uh, but we'll get to a point where I think we'll decide whether or not some next steps are appropriate. What's wrong with that as a transition? What's wrong with that as a closing question for another meeting? Do not hurry through this. Make sure you have the time to explore not only where your prospect is, but where they could go and hopefully where you can both go together. This is how I approach discovery. It's always worked for me. You get your prospects talking. You've earned the respect. You've earned another conversation, whether that's to present or just for more discovery. And I think that if you viewed this as an opportunity rather than something you just need to check off a list, you, will gonna, you are going to have uh, a lot more success. You're going to close a lot more deals. You're going to close them at higher profit margins. Um, everybody wins because your customer feels understood and they're willing to move forward with you. When you do good discovery, deals don't stall. You either know that you're moving forward or you clearly understand that you're not a good fit. And either one of those is a positive. Thanks for listening to me today. I'm going to move on from this because I've got Jason coming next week. Absolutely one of my favorite people to talk selling with. And what he does when it comes to discovery is going to really help you. Can't wait to dig into that. We might be a little longer than your regular interview episode, uh, but we're going to have a good time and you're going to learn a lot from it. Thank you for being here with me. Make sure you subscribe so you get notification when the next episode airs. And I will talk to you again really soon. Rethink the Way You Sell is a Pot About It production. It's mixed and edited by Doug Branson, with music by Blue Dot Sessions and Doug Branson. This podcast is masterminded by Jeff Bajorek.